you know, if I'm not perfect, then I'm worthless. I'd never done drugs, but here I am. And I got high that day. And I, I'm not kidding you. This thought crossed my mind right away. Whoa, I'm going to do this every day for the rest of my life. I remember just like being in my apartment. There's like nothing in my apartment back then. And I opened up my Bible and I just like started reading it. I don't remember what, but then I remember just like looking up to the ceiling and being like, uh, God, you know, it had been a long time. Yeah. And I just felt like I had my back turned towards him and I felt like I had been walking so far away. I was trying to get away from him as far as I possibly could. But in that moment, when I turned, it was like he was right there. Lord, thank you for uh, the opportunity to sit down. And, uh, you know, I, I just love talking to Sam. And, and I pray that through this story, uh, whatever is shared, that you're glorified through it. And just, uh, I'm just so blessed again to, to know Sam and to know uh, parts of this story and what you've done in his life and through him and, uh, and his wife Mandy and all the guys that he's been able to mentor and disciple. Um, really, he continues to do it and glorify you with everything he does. So just bless this time we have and we give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So welcome to Love Story Podcast. We're going to be talking to Sam Petro, the discipleship director at 180. My name is Matt Jackson. I'm the Love Church Elkhorn South Campus pastor. And I have the privilege of working working alongside Sam at 180 as well. So this is going to be fun, Sam. I'm excited. Oh yeah, yeah. And we were talking briefly before we started, like where do we where do we start? And I think it makes sense to like chronologically talk about kind of your life from yeah. from uh, how you were raised and and then through high school and then some college. You always talk about how you played football for like what a semester in college. <laughs> Yeah, played football would be uh, like you, an overstatement. You made I practiced. A <laughs> yeah, I practiced against the starters. Against the starters. Yeah, and then really want to talk about your time, uh, you know, not only at 180, but what you've what you've done before this, and I'll mm -hmm. call it your your career of discipleship. Yeah, wow. We, we been... couldn't have <clears throat> we couldn't be doing what we're doing at 180 without you. So, really, let's start there. Tell me. Hmm, I kind of have the cheat code because I know some of this stuff. Well, I'm excited about. I, I, w I can't wait to find out what you don't know about don't. my story. So okay. this is going to be cool. Yeah, go. I mean, childhood. How, like, what, was your, what was your family home like? What was the upbringing? What were your parents, siblings, all that? Yeah. Christ-centered um, home? Yes. I would say, you know, I had an amazing upbringing, amazing home, uh, two parents that uh, were already serving the Lord when I was born. Uh, there were... Five of us siblings growing up. We added a sixth later on when I was older and out of the house already. Um, but an amazing home. Mom and dad were awesome. My dad was actually a pastor. So he became a pastor um, when I was pretty young still. And I remember, man, growing up like in a parsonage, you know, like the, the house mm. next to the church. Yeah. Um, and it was really, really good. You know, there weren't a lot of traumatic events um, in my childhood, my parents were raising me in the word, you know, I was, uh, homeschooled for a good part of that, which I really actually enjoyed and like loved. Through elementary. Yeah, I actually <clears throat> was homeschooled all the way through elementary. I think seventh grade, I started doing like part-time school. Um, but yeah, along the way, so I was actually born in Michigan and that's my, when my dad was, uh, became a, a pastor. He was, uh, what they call an associate pastor out there. And then he, got this head pastor opportunity job like out in Milford, Nebraska. Yeah. So we, I've never been in, I'd never been in Nebraska in my life. I was 10 years old. We move uh, the whole family out there. And that was, that was really great. I think it was, it was impactful. The one thing about that was I think my roots were severed mm. at age 10. You know, all my extended family is there. And I was in a new community, new group of friends, you know, all of a sudden anybody who's, you know, moved yeah. to a totally new location at a young age might be able to like know what that feels like. But I, I remember 
not being from that town. It was one of these towns where kind of there's generation after generation of family and we were the the new, new family. family. And yeah, it was it was it was hard to assimilate and um and so I think that is part of my story that probably plays in uh, later on. But it was a great childhood. I actually love that town, man, have some amazing friends from there. And it was a great place to grow up, like, you know, 1,800 people. You got to ride your bike around town yeah. and uh, be gone all day, you know. Um, be at the swimming pool all day, um, play in the creeks, you know, all day. So I loved uh, my childhood. I remember you know, making a decision for the Lord when I was younger. My dad kind of walked me through that process of um, understanding what the gospel is and the fact that I'm a sinner and in need of a Savior and needed to make a decision for myself. And uh, for me, it looked like praying a prayer with him uh, at a young age. And for, uh, for many years when I was younger, up until age 15, I was what my mom would describe as the complacent child or, or not complacent. That's compliant. Compliant. Yeah. Like I followed the rules. Yes. Like when my mom and dad told me to do something, I did it. Uh, and I had other siblings that were not exactly that way. Um, like they were the troublemakers when we were younger. And so what was, what's funny is those, those roles really reversed as I got older, <laughs> but I was the compliant kid, compliant kid. Uh, when I was younger and uh, just, you know, excelled in, um, academics and, you know, did things like Bible quizzing and memorized a ton of scripture, was really involved in church activities and did band and some other sports and, and activities. And um, as I was getting older, there was some pressure that was mounting to perform. I think for like, who? I don't, you know, here's the problem with being like an eight year old or a 10 year old is you're constantly misinterpreting life around you. Um, I don't think my parents were submitting me to a ton of pressure. Um, but for some reason, I interpreted yeah. life to be like, oh, I need to perform, you know? And I think the, I think the truth is, like looking back now, I didn't know this back then. I didn't know any of this back then. You know, I've, I've had to kind of like piece this together. I've had to process some things. I've had to go deep with the Lord on some of this stuff. But I realize now it's like, man, the enemy was laying traps for me, yeah. right? Like he was sowing seeds uh, at that young age, right? He, there, were, there were things that he was whispering in my ear and I was, I was making agreements with it. You know, that, uh, for example, um, you know, if I'm not perfect, then I'm worthless, and so there was this perfectionism vein that was showing up in my life of uh, wanting to be a high performer, you know, getting a 95% on a test was, wasn't good enough. Um, you know, my mom took away cursive from me. There was a thing called cursive back in the day for the younger li <laughs> listeners, but man, because I would, I would erase it and oh. redo it and erase it and redo it. And I'd be in tears and I'd erase all the way through the page. And my mom's like, you're not doing this anymore. Mm. But I'm like, it's not perfect. And that's just like a microcosm of what began to happen in my life. So I'm having this great upbringing. I'm being trained in the word, but there's this thing that's happening inside of me where I felt like I needed to be perfect and perform and not let my parents down, not let teachers down, you know? So, um, yeah, I'm just kind of like setting you up for like this turning point. But I can see even, <clears throat> we'll, like, we'll, I'm not going to lose the spot in your yeah. life, but... <clears throat> I can see that how you've worked through it, process it, and understand it about yourself. That you're not a um, you you don't. From my perspective, working with you now for almost four years, if you can believe that, I don't see that in you anymore. Not meaning you don't you strive for excellence, but you don't get bumped by yourself or anybody else if it's not perfect or if it's um, you know. I just see that you're not you don't struggle with that now, which yeah. is really cool. Yeah. As, as my boss, you're like, man, hey, if you know, <laughs> your perfectionism could come out a little bit more often, <laughs> not, you know? Not at all. <laughs> no, but I see that you don't struggle with that. Yeah. It's a testament to you and you yeah. working through that as an adult and recognizing it, you know, oh, man, it, hindsight. It blew up on me bad. And I think this is probably, I think perfectionists out there, guys, you know, people that have struggled with perfectionism yeah. know what, what comes with that. And so for me, uh, Man, I, let's see here. 
I'm trying to think what else is important to share. You know, I changed school. So I, I was homeschooled. I was mm -hmm. kind of an outsider being a homeschooled kid. And then I started going into the public school, but I didn't quite fit in, didn't quite belong. And then I changed schools. My dad became, uh, he was still a pastor, but he was also teaching mm. uh, Bible at a Christian school in Lincoln. So we got to have free tuition. So I started going to this Christian school and that was really great. But I was just, I'm constantly in these new environments, making all these new friends and probably, um, yeah, like, again, those are things that just affected me. Like maybe people didn't really know me and I wasn't really letting myself be truly known. Um, I, you know, struggling with identity at a young age. I think everybody does. Yeah, yeah. And it, those things were just being exasperated by, um, by some of these, these changes that I was going through. So I'm in a new school again. And then we, my dad stops teaching. So we lose our free tuition. So we go back to the public school and they're like, Oh, you're back. And then, uh, and then age 15, then, then, <laughs> um, man, I think everything just hit the fan and the pressure just really, really got to me again. I don't think my parents were doing this to me. I don't think my teachers were doing this to me. I mean, people, you know, had, had praised my performances growing up. And I don't know if I just like needed that significance, needed that approval. I'm like, I just have to have to keep that coming or I have to perform well. I don't know how, again, what happened. There's, I think there's some spiritual warfare, like the enemy knows, and he's, he's going to try to use that against you at some point. So, um, age 15, man, I started struggling with, uh, pornography. So that was, this was the beginning of, um, this huge shift in my life, man. And I didn't, and I knew it was wrong. I mean, I, I felt so much shame and so much guilt felt so, so dirty to me, you know, hiding it from people. Um, you know, even friends that probably were getting into some of the same things yeah. at that age. It's like, I didn't want them to know either. So I didn't talk to anybody about it and just hit it. And it became, uh, this, this secret addiction and man, the the shame that came with it was was the worst. I mean, I just felt there's such a wedge that was driven between me and anything of the anything of the Lord. And I felt like, you know, such a big fake and phony and I felt so terrible about myself. And I just I'm telling you, I woke up one day. It was all in one day. And I thought, you know what the real problem is here? It's, it's God's standards. You know, what oh. the, you know what the real problem is here? It's other people's standards. It's my mom and dad. It's teachers or whoever uh, expecting so much from me. Dude, if, if, if I just didn't have to worry about what God thought about my sin or what my parents thought about my performance, if I could just like get out from under that, then I wouldn't feel so bad about yeah. myself. I wouldn't feel so, I wouldn't feel not good enough in all these different areas. And that was, that was it. I'm telling you overnight, I went from being the compliant child to I'm going to do whatever I want. I don't even know what I want. But you're going to, I'm going to go out. find out. Yeah. And I began, I just launched man into this rebellion mode Rebellion against God, rebellion against my parents, rebellion against authority, and it played out. And I was just experimenting with, you know, I don't know, breaking the rules. You know, it's like stuff I've never done before, you know, like sneaking out, smoking cigs. And I don't know, I just, I thought it was awesome. And I thought I was in control I thought I was a free man. Finally, you know, I was out from under the yoke of, yeah. uh, you know, my parents and God. And what's crazy is I never like, I never, I didn't like, I mean, like I always believed that God was who he was. It's like, I knew he was so real, but I just, I just thought I, I couldn't reconcile this issue that I had with, you know, his standards. And so I was like, well, I'm just going to do my own thing. So how long did you kind of struggle in that? weird place of shame and guilt. He said 15. Yeah. How long was that before you went, you know what, if I just, I don't, if I don't pay attention to the rules and go break it. Like how, what was that a year, six months? Yeah. So that was, I mean, 
the rest of high school was really, really hard. Mm. Um, you know, went from having a 4.0 GPA to barely graduating high school. Wow. Um, went from, man, being a high performer in different activities to quitting almost everything. And, um, yeah, I went from, like, enjoying family time and family life to can't be around my family. Um, got kicked out of my house a couple times my senior year. I mean, so this, so this, so high school, I mean, just plays out. My parents switched schools again. They're like, well, we'll oh, pay dear. for the, we'll pray, we'll pay for the private education. Maybe it's the public school that's screwing this kid up. It wasn't the public school that was screwing me up. <laughs> I go into the private school, you know, and I'm just continuing to rebel. Um, but yeah, my senior year was really hard. Uh, I, I, you know, had, had my own wheels and my own money, my own job. You know, I thought I was like, I thought I knew everything. Oh yeah. You know, and um, man, I think I was 17 years old, dude. And I just, you couldn't tell me what to do. And my parents couldn't tell me what to do. So they, you know, you're grounded. Oh, what does that mean? What, what are you going to do? Are you right. going to physically prevent me from walking out of this house? You know, I would test everything and they kicked me out. So towards the end of my senior year, they kicked me out. I'm like, good, I'm not coming back. And just played this game of chicken with my parents. Like, I, like I'll, I'll just be gone. Like, I'll never come back. And... You know, it's like the police showed up to find me, you know. So I'm like 17. Yeah. You know, I can't not live with my mom and dad, I guess. There's like laws for that. So, yeah, I'm like, I'm like talking to the police officer. I'm like, what are my options here? Like, do I really have to go with you? He's like, dude, you're either like, you're going with me. It's like, how do you want to go with me? You know, like, well, you're going back to your mom and dad's house tonight. How easy do you want? How <laughs> yeah. hard or easy do you want to make? I'm like, I'll ride in the front seat. I'm like, I'll be cool. I'll ride the front seat. But the last couple of months of my senior year were bad. I mean, probably didn't talk to my mom and dad much and just barely got through, almost didn't graduate. And then my plan was to just leave the state and go to college out of state. So ended up doing that. Went to, um, so not on good terms with my parents at all. They didn't think I should go to college. So I thought they just weren't going to be supportive of me, you know course they were a lot smarter than I was like they knew what was going to happen if I went to college um because I wasn't being a good student you know uh, but yeah I went to this little tiny college in Kansas they were recruiting my buddy yep. who's a good football player I don't know if I told you this story this yeah. is so funny I gotta tell this uh he was a good football player um and I love playing football but like dude I'm I'm like I'm not the guy I'm not your no one offered me a scholarship okay so, but but we're on a recruiting visit and I'm in the off the recruiting office or in the head coach's office with with my buddy who's a great athlete and they're like hey man we want you to come play for us and if you sign with us your friend can play Piggyback. too yeah and I'm like bro you gotta sign I'm like you have to sign with them because I'm about to play college football and uh, what's nuts about that is. Uh, they honored his scholarship, even though he had this crazy brain injury when he, we were uh, doing track and field by the end of our senior year, and he never played football again. He stayed with the team as like a trainer or something. Wow. Um, but they got me, so I, I got to be on the team. So, uh, And then, yeah, that was all short-lived. College was short-lived. I wasn't going to class, man. I was um, just consumed by the wrong things. You know, there was like a girl that I really liked back then, and uh, she was, you know, the god in my life. Pro she was, she was yeah, the yeah. idol, you know, and yep. and that was going to be the thing that fulfilled me. And that wasn't working out. Failed out of college, and I just, um, yeah, man, came home totally defeated. I had moved myself into college. There's like this freshman day like parents bring their freshmen in and you were so I was by myself you know I was I was just so hard-hearted and here I am now failing out of college like a few months later they're like please don't come back and I I was on I did end up on academic scholarship what's crazy is I barely graduated high school but they still gave me these great this great academic package because of like some test scores that I had and anyway but here I am you know not the football player they want uh, 0 0.9 GPA. So they're like, to get a they're like, dude, you're on academic scholarship. You're a terrible athlete. Like, we just don't want you here. Please go home. So that was a, um, that felt like rejection, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and I had, that was a wound. I think that had, was developing with other things that had happened in my life. Nothing crazy, but it was like, you know, it's like 
what was happening with my family and my parents getting kicked out of the house. I think it's what I want, but it's like the heart inside of me was like, oh, that hurts. My mom and dad don't want me at home anymore, even though it's like my, you're making I the, did it. You're making the choice. My mom and dad are that, just, yeah. they're doing the right thing actually by kicking me out probably. But anyway, I came home just feeling like a loser, man. And uh, you know, that, that idea of like, dude, if you're not perfect, you're worthless. Like that had never really left me. And so here I am in college dropout and that's when things get really dicey. It takes another turn, I think, at this point. So I'm 18, 19. I just go to work full time. And, uh, Living at your parents' house? So actually, yeah, my mom and dad let me come oh. home, which was crazy. So that was surprising and surprising that I was what I decided to do. But I didn't have options. You know, I mean, I was pretty humbled. Um, but I still had a very hard heart. And uh, I really wanted to move out pretty quickly. That didn't last long, to be honest with you. So I got, went back out on my own, got a full-time job, started paying all my own bills and was like, okay, I guess I'm an adult now. And I, I wanted to be independent from my parents. So I, I did okay doing that. Um, but yeah, things were still really rocky with the family for years, probably until like age 23 or 24, age 22, wow. somewhere there. So a few more years, just really, really rocky with the family. What happened was, here's the thing though, is you, for me, man, filling out of college and then going back home, there was only, uh, there was like seniors in high school to hang out with, like high school kids to hang out with who were partying. Or there's like other kids that didn't go to college or other kids that had just failed out of college. And for some reason, the crowd that I wound up with were um, just not uh, superstars. None of us were uh, doing well. And so, man, it was just, they were guys that were getting into drugs. And so I thought that uh, guys that did drugs were so stupid. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm like, dude, guys that smoke, um, they're, they're so dumb. I mean, I just met a few of them, and I'm like, you guys are so dumb. I would never do that. But. I hear a, I hear a vow. <laughs> but. I would never do that. Yeah, so then what, what happened was, um, I remember this day so vividly. There was this new thing. It wasn't, it wasn't weed. It wasn't marijuana. It was called K2. So it was like, um, I don't know, this like synthetic drug that they would kind of like spray on like potpourri or herbs or something that you, that you would smoke and get high. But it was legal. It was new, it was, it was interesting, it was cool, um, and it was legal. You just go to the store and buy it. It was nuts. Um, and so I thought to myself, well, it's not weed. It's legal. It's legal. Um, seems cool. I need something to do. And we were cleaning up my buddy's front yard after the 4th of July. So it was like July 5th, 2019. I mean, I don't remember many dates. Especially once I started using drugs, those dates. July especially when, of 2019 couldn't have been. Or no, not 2019. Yeah, I was like, wait a minute. Sorry, 2009. Like, Man, I'm sorry. Like, cut. We got the dates wrong. <laughs> there's a whole decade. Yeah, yeah. we missed a decade. I was I've like, been okay. 30 days clean and sober today. <laughs> uh, so no, no, July sorry. 5th, 2009. Let's 2009. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, I uh, buddy came out from his garage with uh, a pipe loaded with this K2 stuff. And I'm like, you know what? Why the heck not? Mm. And so for the first time ever, even though I jacked around with other stuff, I had drank, I'd, I'd partied a little bit in my little rebellious phase in high school. I'd never done drugs, but here I am. And I got high that day. And I, I'm not kidding you. This thought crossed my mind right away. Whoa. I'm going to do this every day for the rest of my life. Dude, first time getting high, and I'm like, I'm going to do this all the time. So by the end of that day, went and bought the stuff that you need to do that. You, you get the, you know, you get the stuff, you get the lighter, you get the, the, the pipe, the bong, whatever. Um, and I'm like, cool, this is what I'm going to do now. And so all my, real, all my friendships began to... Uh, revolve around that lifestyle. So I had a job. I had a great job, actually. I was like working a corporate 
it's like a fortune 500 company. They, they loved me. They thought I was like the coolest 18 year old kid. They're like, Hey, this kid has talent. We're going to like teach this kid how to be great. Uh, meanwhile, I'm like, um, developing this like drug habit on the side and it was all fun and games for a while there. Uh, I was successful, uh, during the day I got promoted. I was getting really cool trainings. Um, really, I was like, dude, who needs college? I I'm, I'm working, mm-hmm. I'm making money. And then I was spending my money on drugs. And, and when I, when I realized how, um, how much I liked that drug, I thought, man, maybe everyone's, maybe everyone's been lying to me about how bad drugs are. And, um, maybe they're not as bad as they seem. Nothing bad is happening. Nothing bad was happening in my life, man. I, it was like all going really good actually for the yeah. first time in a little <laughs> while. So I'm like, you know what? Maybe everyone's just doing it wrong. You know, I'm going to be, I'm going to be Sam's really gonna good be, at this. He's going to be really good and it's going to be different. Dude. So I began experimenting, you know, with other, other drugs. And that was kind of the common pattern for me was like, you know, I would work hard and then I would get off work and I would smoke and get high. And then on the weekends I had these friends that were like getting into different types of drugs. And so we would go experimenting with different things. And I was like, man, yeah, let me get my hands on anything. Yeah. We're, what are we doing this weekend? You know? And so it was, um, getting out of control at a certain point. So this is when I knew that something was not quite right was when I would be start missing work, you know, and I really enjoyed my job, but now I'm not, now I'm not going to work. Um, you know, you get put on like attendance warnings and stuff and I'd fight through that and then I'd get promoted again. And I'd just get on another attendance warning and the, I was like this, you know, sums up with the drugs. Like I bet I could just like, maybe I don't have a drug problem. And I'm going to prove that to myself by not doing drugs for 30 days. I would do things like that, you know, make those deals. And I would go three days, mm. you know, and, and I was like, dude, I, I don't think I can stop. I think I have to have this. You know, it was always an escape for me. All my problems would go away. I was, you know, it became a self-medicating thing. Um and I was like, I don't, I don't want to be without that actually. So yeah, I think I got, I'm trying to think where this all came unglued. Everything came unglued. All I had to do with work. Again, I had this great job, but I think I was in this like, um, special training program and I was, I was supposed to just show up, man. And I, and I didn't show up for this one thing and and I knew it, and I was so I uh, felt so bad that I didn't show up again for another like week or two oh, wow. from work. I mean, like just went MIA, and I'm like hiding out. And my boss must have known, right, that I had been struggling. He sent some people like to f- find me, and uh, yeah, like pull me out of this house and be like. I don't know what you got to do, but go get him, go get him sobered up. Like he needs to be here tomorrow or he loses his job. Um, so it, it became very, very serious for me at that point. And I remember, I remember just, I remember reaching out to my mom and dad for the first time in a long time being like, Hey, I think I'm in trouble. Um, Things are not good. Yeah. When I had actually thrown the whole drug thing in their face, like when I was like really getting into it, I'd go, I'd stop by and I'd be like, hey, guess what? I do all the drugs and they're awesome and I'm great. <laughs> and I would just like throw it in their face, man. It was, I was so mean. I would say the most terrible things to my mom and dad. And I'm like, it's like, I know it's wrecking them. Man, I just had such a hard heart towards them. Um. But I called, I reached out to him and I'm like, I think I'm in big trouble. Um, I can't stop using. Um, I think, you know, I'm going to lose my job. Um, and I didn't, I didn't lose my job. My mom and dad came and rescued me out of my apartment. They let me live at their house and I started wow. going through treatment. I remember I like called the employee assistance help, EAP, yeah. is that what it's called? Employee yeah. assistance program yep. helpline. And uh, cause we had great benefits. So it's like, I was going to have some options, you know, to get some help. And, and I'm talking to the lady on the, on the hotline and 
She's like, all right, what drugs have you done? And I'm like, I just go down the list. She's like, okay, what drugs have you done recently? And I go down the list and she's like, okay, can you go to the hospital immediately? And I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> Listen, it's fine. I just need to like, I can't miss work tomorrow. <laughs> I was like, so whatever we do, <laughs> whatever we figure out uh, for treatment, I just can't miss work. I need to keep going to work. And so, yeah, I did this intensive outpatient treatment, IOP. Mm-hmm treatment back then. And I started going to, uh, narcotics anonymous, uh, meetings back then. And I'm living with my mom and dad. And I, I, I turned back to the Lord. So I've been rejecting him, rebelling against him. And, uh, I don't think I was really all the way there yet, but there was a powerful moment for me. I think it was when I was in my apartment that last week. Oh yeah, dude. Yeah, so I remember when I got in trouble at work, I hadn't quite reached out to my mom and dad yet. But I was seven days clean and sober. I had stopped using. But I remember uh, everything went gray. I was having some kind of withdrawal. I don't yeah. know. Everything went gray. And then all, and then I couldn't hear sounds very well. It was like really far away. It was like I was underwater all the time. And I was so scared. I'm, yeah, like, I'm like, great, dude. I just blew my brain out, yeah. you know, with the drugs. Like, what have I done? And it didn't like come back for like seven days. I was in this weird thing where everything was gray. Couldn't hear good. I'm like trying to go to work, but I'm like, I like can't think straight. I'm like losing track of everything. And that was when I reached out to my mom and dad. I was like, I'm in big trouble. I need help. And I, um, it, but in that seven day period, I remember turning back to the Lord. That's what I want to share. So I remember just like being in my apartment there's like nothing in my apartment back then. And I opened up my Bible and I just like started reading it. I don't remember what, but then I remember just like looking up to the ceiling and being like, uh, God, <laughs> you know, it had been a long time. Yeah. And I just felt like I had my back turned towards him and I felt like I had been walking so far away. I was trying to get away from him as far as I possibly could. But in that moment, when I turned, it was like he was right there. And he's like, I'm right here, Sam. And it wrecked me. Hmm. Growing up, I thought I had a relationship with God based on my performance, mm-hmm. right? Being this good Christian kid, doing the right things, Bible quizzing, memorizing tons of scripture, whatever, you know, going to church, doing the things. But here I am. I'm a drug addict. Full blown drug addict. I'm about to lose everything. Mm-hmm. I I I had said the most terrible things to people, to God. I've done I'd done terrible things. And he's like, I'm right here. Right there. <laughs> Dude. I don't think I was there yet, but man, I was on my way. Um, and that was a powerful moment in my life. It, the grace of God. Yeah. For the first time, I think. I think I, I think I understood it and felt it for the first time. I don't earn, you don't earn that. You don't deserve that. Um, so yeah, man, I'm back at home with my mom and dad now, and I'm trying to re-engage in this like Christianity thing, this relationship with Jesus thing. And I'm like, I guess I should read my Bible, you know? And so I kind of knew where to start, you know. Um and I stopped doing a lot of the things that I was doing. But there was so much that still needed to change, man, inside of me. I was not free. Um, I was still very hurt by my own choices and mm-hmm. by just some of the consequences of life and uh, some of the things that I had believed that the enemy had told me along the way. And I still had so much to do. But um, I was trying to reconnect with the Lord and uh, trying to live right. I think I went eight months clean and sober <laughs> and things got a lot better with my family i played a game of chess every day with my dad for eight months that was kind of cool you know read my bible went to church um i kept my job for those eight months and yeah i just like dude it's crazy what god did next because i was not quite there yet something still had to be done but um, one of the things that needed to be done is I needed to I needed 
to get away from uh, this career that I had kind of kept kept going, limping along, and I needed to I, I needed some really serious help and discipleship. And I'm telling you, it was the, it was the craziest thing. But I got this job offer to to move to Dubai, and to um, and I thought I was going to work that job that I had forever. I was yeah. like, dude, I I got hired when I was 18. 20 years in, I'm going to be the CEO of this company. I'll be 38 years old. I mean, you know, I just probably not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I love that job. And I thought, you know what? Maybe I'll be here forever. But then all of a sudden, everything's changing in my life. I'm getting clean and sober. And then this Dubai opportunity comes up. And I'm like, oh, man, maybe God wants me to be a missionary in Dubai. So I take this job. I get connected with this, like, missionary organization it's a crazy story. I, I'll tell you some other time. <laughs> we got, we'll I'll have tell you guys. Sam some, part, we'll, have, yeah, we'll have Sam part two. There's this whole like three month thing of me quitting this this job that I loved, um, going to Dubai, and I really believe this was God. Like it was the only thing that would maybe get me away from that job because He had something else for me down yeah. the road. But I took the bait, went to Dubai, and I uh, was going to be this like undercover missionary in a Muslim. Wow country and I had no idea how to do that. I mean, I probably wasn't even saved. I mean, I, you know, there's, you know, I, very debatable about my salvation at this point in time. There wasn't fruit in my life really yet. And um, so I'm going, I go over there and it's just crazy. So things don't work out. In fact, I relapse while I'm out there mm. and it's a disaster. And I come home totally defeated again. I'm like, man, I thought that was it. You know, I'm going to work in Dubai and do this thing. Gave up that other job and I come home and I'm like working at a department store, you know, back at mom and dad's. And, and I had relapsed and, tr- and got off the drugs again. So I'm trying to like, this starts a cycle now for the next two, two years or so. Um, or I was, I was kind of already on this yep. cycle, I guess. Yeah. I'm trying to bounce around the story, but anyway, I ended up Doing okay for a while, relapsing. Doing okay for a while, relapsing. And it was very, very uh, cyclical because I wasn't free. There, You know, right? It was like white-knuckling stuff. Mm-hmm. And there was so much inside of me that hadn't been dealt with yet. So getting closer to what God really wanted to do in my life. Um, but, man, it took me um, using again, getting in trouble with my parents. They call, you know, they called the police. I went, I woke up in an ambulance, handcuffed to the gurney. I got in trouble with the courts uh, on back to back days. I had these, these, these tickets and citations for drug use and um, these different charges that come with that. And I'm like a disaster. And I'm like, man, I I keep doing this. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd been playing this cycle out of relapse for a while now. I just failed out on this other stuff that I was trying to do. And, um, my parents had kicked me out again. I'm staying at a buddy's house. He takes me. He's like, let's go grab a bite to eat. He takes me to my mom and dad's house for an intervention. I'm like, oh, okay. Dude. This is like the third thing I didn't know. Okay. Dude, I'm like, you cannot do do that to me, you know? So I have to like sit through this intervention. My whole family's there telling me, um, you know, that they love me. Yeah. And I didn't want to hear any of it. Um, I was actively using at the time I was in the middle of a relapse, just hurting dude. They had this like, uh, application printed off from adult and teen challenge. So man, David Wilkerson started this amazing ministry in the fifties to help get, uh, kids get off drugs. And it ends up becoming this, uh, there's adult versions of the program. There's men's programs, women's programs. There's still teenager versions out there. Phenomenal. Um, a lot of locations. And I'd heard about it. What's funny is I used to drive around in my car listening to Christian radio. radio. And I'd be like, using drugs. It's like, because I knew that, I knew I needed to go towards Jesus. Uh, and I'd hear these commercials about Adult, Adult and Teen, Teen Challenge. Challenge. Anyway, they printed out the application for me. It's like a year long program, hardcore discipleship, hardcore, very structured. I mean, you give up everything, everything. to go there. And I remember my dad saying, it's time to do something drastic. I'm like, whatever. I took the application. I ran out of there. I'm like, I'll, I'll do, I'll think about it. I'll do it. But I was just, 
I was trying to get out of that room of the intervention. And so I take the application with me and a couple weeks later though, it was still sitting around in our, in the words my dad had said, it's time to do something something drastic. drastic. We're bouncing around in my head. I'm like, man, court coming up. I've done this cycle so many times now. I filled out the application. I applied, did the interviews. They accepted me into the program. And I'm like, what am I doing? Mm. 12 months. So I go to court. I'm already accepted to go into this program. And it's like, you know, depending on what happens with court, I could go in next Tuesday. And the ju- and I just sit, stand there in front of the judge. I'm like, hey, judge, here's my plan. And he's like, okay, that's a good plan. Here's what I'm going to do. And he, he threw out some charges. He gave me diversion for a couple of the charges. I think there's like one or two charges still on my record, which, yeah, there was a bunch more that were supposed to be on there. So um, all I had to do was like four months of diversion. And technically, if I went to the program, it would like fulfill all the requirements. So, man, it was awesome. And this is what God, that's what God wanted me to do, I think, was just he wanted to get me to this place where I could be discipled, where I could get some healing and some freedom. So I go into Adult and Teen Challenge in Colfax, Iowa, and what are you were twenty two ish, maybe. Yeah, by now it's twenty four. Yeah, so oh. there was a couple years yeah. there that I kind of skipped where I'm just like going yeah. through the just going the through the, the cycle, cycle of relapse. relapse. Yep, gotcha. So I kind of okay. skipped ahead there, but yeah, no, it's good. Um, and I'm twenty four. Uh, you know, I give up everything to go in. I didn't have much. I had a car, probably a cell phone, but you can't have cell phone or anything there. So you just get dropped off, and. Uh, yeah, man, I was just, I didn't know it, but I was an angry person. I remember hearing these happy people talk to each other so full of love. I love you, man. I love you, man. I'm like, why do you guys keep saying saying that? that? They're like, what's wrong with you? I'm like, I'm just not fake like you. I didn't know. I didn't Uh know. And these are other guys that are in the program already. And I'm like, dude, oh, here am I? But it was this amazing place. Um, 88 acres. Uh, there's 50 guys in the program. They have incredible staff and it is just a Jesus loving ministry. It's the power of the Holy spirit setting people free. And so, man, I start my journey there and it was like the, for the first time ever, I think I could just take the mask off. Didn't have to try to perform. Didn't have to even like try to be a rebel or whatever, you know, wherever I'd been finding my identity over the last 10 years or whatever it'd been. I could just like set all that aside and say, okay, it's me and you, Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I began encountering God in just powerful ways. He was speaking to me. And I'm telling you, I just, I I didn't know that he loved me so much. Regardless of perfection or performance. I was just this burnout drug addict (laughs) in a program for 12 months because I couldn't, I couldn't get it right. And man, I'm telling you, it was so personal. This personal revelation of God's love for me began to just wreck me. You know, that's what I needed mm-hmm. my whole life. You know, I needed to, I needed a personal revelation from Him and His love. And um, man, I just we would do chapel every morning and. I don't remember what worship song it was, but I'm just like singing my guts out. It's like all dudes and none of us could sing. It was nuts, man. But we were worshiping Jesus and we were in love with Jesus. But I, but he he just I just felt the Holy Spirit speak so specifically to me. Hey Sam, if you're the only one I ever came to save, I would do it for you. Dang. You know, like hey Sam, I love you. I'm like yeah yeah yeah, Lord, I know you. Yeah yeah, Lord, you love the whole world. For God so loved the world. Yeah. That he gave his life, you know. He's like, no, 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 like, no, I, I, I love you. If it was just you, I'd do it again. And it just, man, I'm telling you, it went from here, like, oh yeah, I know God loves me, went to here, and I just fell on the ground crying. God loves me. <laughs> <laughs> he loves me. We get, if we get two criers on the set, Sam, we're going to have a problem. He loves San Petro, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and I was just crazy, man. I was just I was just a loser, you know. I was just a, I was just a drug addict. At least that's what I've been telling myself for a yeah. long time. And he began telling me, you're not a drug addict. 
It's not who I made you to be. Don't walk around saying that. Identity. You're my son? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Man, he was speaking identity into yeah. me. Yeah. Man, I had to find these identities and all these all things. And, junk. Oh, man. I was being... Now I, I know. I was being transformed. I know. We'll get And we'll get to it. But now I know why you're so adamant with our guys at 180 about yeah. speaking identity, who they are. That's because it's... that. Okay, this is number four thing I didn't know. Like, I always wondered, and it made total sense, logical. Yeah. But now I know why. It's because of that revelation you had. In that moment, the Lord's saying, I love you. I would do it again for just you. And speaking identity. Wow. Yeah, changed my life forever. And, yeah, just continued. And what's crazy is, dude, I just... Yeah, it was a bumpy journey. I mean, it was a long 12 months. Ended Uh up being 13 months. Got in trouble. You needed the baker's dozen months. Yeah, I got in (laughs) trouble while I was there. I, uh, man, those guys, if you go talk to the guys I was in the program, they'll tell you, you know, that was a jerk sometimes. But what you're... I was just growing. It's learning. Sanctification. We're all in process. Yeah. Yeah, dealing with pride. I mean, I had all these other issues that were coming to the surface, man, and... um, so yeah, guys wrecking me, but I, I tried to quit the program one day. I mean, that's a whole nother story. I had a bus ticket. I'm like waiting at the bus station to like go back to Lincoln, like chain smoking cigarettes. <laughs> I'm like, what am I doing? I don't, <laughs> I don't even this smoke. This isn't me anymore. You know, I'm just like, um, and then they let me come back into the program. I'm like, I'm making a mistake. I'm making a mistake. And they came back and got me um, and let me finish the program. And um, yeah, man, I ended up in Omaha uh, This at phase two of their program to finish out the 13 months. It was five months in Omaha at the end there. And uh, it's just a different guy, man. Went, went Started working again uh, during that phase, and I was just a different guy, you know. And I just didn't care what people thought of me anymore. Um, the performance thing wasn't as big of a deal anymore. You know, um, man, I just was so grateful and thankful. And that was like the overflow of why I got to do what I got to do. And um, I knew how God felt about me. He told, he had told yeah. me. Um, so I don't care what you think. Dude, if you think I'm a lunatic, um, okay, no problem. Like, dude, if, or you don't think I'm cool because I don't talk the way you talk. Like I'm in the workplace and like, I like I'm just like, not the same as everybody else. And I wasn't putting anything in anybody's face or, or down their throat. But people were like, hey, why don't you like save certain things? I just, man, I just don't. Mm-hmm. You know, and I didn't, and people were like, you're just kind of weird. And, uh, but I didn't care what people thought. So it was amazing uh, finishing out my time at Adult and Teen Challenge. And then I, um, yeah, I went to a leadership college in Lincoln uh, for a year that was kind of ministry focused and that was super cool. Just uh, learned how to hear God's voice and learned how to lead and learned how to do some ministry stuff. And I'm telling you, I thought I would never go back to Adult and Teen Challenge. They kind of asked if like if anyone would be interested in an internship when they got done. And I'm like, nope. Never say never. <laughs> So I, I went to college. I, I was going to do something totally different. You know, I thought maybe ministry stuff, you yeah. know, but uh, man, Adult Teen Challenge called me a year later when I was getting out of the leadership college program and they're like, um, hey, would you ever come back? I'm like, no. no. They're like, well, but we have a new uh, like drug prevention program that's going into high schools and sharing uh, stories. And it's not like you're not really like working. You're not doing on duty stuff. You're not like working with the guys in the program because I um, just didn't want to do that. I had. You know, there was, um, yeah, I just didn't want to do that. But I, like, looked the idea of the drug prevention stuff. So I was like, yeah, dude, uh, go talk to high school kids, like, share my story or, like, help other people figure out how to craft their story and share theirs. So we started doing this thing. And I would say we, we, we tried for a couple years there. But the program was a total flop. Wow. I and mean, we just couldn't get traction. And, like two other staff members that were doing the ministry side with the guys quit the same time I came on. So they're like, Hey man, we know like you weren't really hired for this job, but like, uh, we kind of need you to like do some on duties, you know, and like be with the guys. And so it, 
became my job. And I loved it. I didn't think I wanted to yeah. do it. I loved it. I ended up being on staff there for, <clears throat> I don't know, four or five years. And God did so much in me. He changed me. Um, I met my wife during that time, my wife, Mandy. We got married and we're, we were living in the, in the adult and teen yeah. challenge house, man, and, and, and doing ministry and uh, loved it, grew a ton. And then, uh, yeah, this is when I found Love Church. So my wife was on staff with Love Church at the time. So how did you meet Mandy? Yeah, so I had just taken the job. I had been there challenge. for like six yep. months, probably. I was going to a different different church, another amazing church in Omaha, and um, we took our guys to abide to hang some Christmas lights. It was like a serve day, yep. like a Saturday serve mm-hmm. they had out there. So I took my guys out there, and there's some like love church people out there. I didn't know any of them, and Mandy was out there, but she knew a coworker of mine. So she came over and hollered at him, and and he's like, "Oh, by the way, this is Sam," and I'm like, "Oh." What's up? She thought I was 19 years old. There's a whole, yeah, she'll have to tell you the story. It's funny. She's like, who's that 19-year-old kid hollering at me? But we ended up, um, you know, getting a double date out of the deal. A few <coughs> weeks later, yeah, my friend had to, like, you know, get his wife involved and scout it out a little bit. But, um, yeah, man, we, uh, yeah, I got together after that. So serving at Abide. Hey, volunteering, yes. serving, great way to, hey, great plug. way to meet your wife. <laughs> Um, so yeah. And so we were doing ministry together at Adult and Teen Challenger for a few years. And so I, uh, she was on staff at Love yeah. Church. So I, man, she had been there for a number of years. I was like at this new church for like six months. And so they were super cool. They're like, they, the pastors like prayed for me, blessed me and like, yeah, dude, go, go do that. You know, and I got to join up with Love Church and just start serving and, um, Man, loved, loved church. What's cool is Mandy dumped me. Uh, I think we'd been dating for like six months. And so I switched. Fifth thing I didn't know. So I switched <laughs> churches, you know, for this girl. And then she dumps me. And so I'm like, you know, the temptation is to like totally bounce. Yeah. I don't want to see her. Um, but I was praying. This is good. You should do that. Yes, right, you, should, you should probably, yeah. And I just felt like the Lord said, hey, Sam, I brought you to... Um, Love church for so much more than, than Mandy. Mm. And I'm like, okay, fine then. And I stayed. I love church, uh, which is cool to see what God's now done through just being able to partner with some ministry stuff at love. But then, yeah, Mandy and I do end up getting back together. How long did it take for her to come back around? Yeah, she was, uh, she was just, I don't know what was her problem. <laughs> I don't know what was her problem. Uh, I, I, I think it was like, a, I don't know, six weeks. Oh, Flip yeah. the radar. Yeah. She came to her senses. She's very logical. Yeah. Yeah, we figured it <laughs> How out. How could she not figure it? Yeah. Yeah. And then and then I like proposed we like got married. I was like, dude, we're not letting you dump me again. Yeah, no. We're we're wrapping this thing Locking up right that now. In. Yeah. And I'm so glad I did. She's the best. Um Yeah, dude. I remember telling <laughs> no, I was Oh, come on. No, dude, we got okay. to, we got was, time. When I was in Adult and Teen Challenge, I'm like, God's wrecking me and he's making me a new man. And I'm like, Lord, I will, I will, I will, I'm just gonna serve you. Like, no matter what, I don't care what my future looks like. If I never get married, I don't care. But I'm not gonna marry somebody who's not sold out for Jesus. And so when I said that to the Lord, I thought for sure what that meant was, um, I, I have to marry somebody who's sold out for Jesus. And there's, and uh, that means it's probably gonna be somebody ugly. And so what I, what I really was thinking was, I ain't doing that, so I'm not going to get married ever because I'm not going to marry an ugly person. It's very shallow. Yeah, right? yeah. This is, this is the real San Petro. So, yeah, man, I, when, I, when I met Mandy, I'm like, whoa, oh. this is a babe, and she sold out for Jesus. I guess I am going to get married. You are going to get married. Yeah. Damn. They're out there. Babes that are sold. Babes out that are sold Jesus. out for Jesus. Can we title the podcast the ba- this is Sam Petro, and he'll help you find a babe that's sold out for Jesus. Uh, no, pro- yeah, <laughs> no, yeah, no promises. We got man. a four step course we're going to be putting out. That's great. Yeah, um, yeah. So anyway, that's just funny. So she's amazing, and we. Uh, okay, so where are what we? Year we what year? What year did you get married? We got married in 2018. 18. Golly, like the spring of that year, right? Uh, June 2nd. So like that's, our anniversary is a few days away. Yeah, coming up. 
that movie. Yeah, really quick. Yeah, because we met. <clears throat> yeah, I didn't. I didn't come to Christ or Love Church until twenty nineteen. Uh, September? No, September of eighteen. Oh, 18. Yeah, we're really all, all, end of August, first part of September of two thousand eighteen. Yeah, so I I remember when you guys started showing up, um, and I was still pretty like new. I was I was still on staff at Adult and Teen Challenge, and so I there was only so much that I was gonna do with Love Church, but I would like volunteer. Yeah, I remember you. I was on some volunteer were at, teams. Like, doing, doing some greeting, probably like welcoming new guests at the yeah. Connect I love table. the MVP yeah. Connect. Ta- I love that, dude. Yeah, yeah, I love meeting the new people and talking about God's mission at Love Church. But I so don't fun. think we had more than a conversation until. 2020 or maybe earlier than that but first part of 2020 because because then walk people through i think it's interesting the process of of having you come on and what you your initial thoughts of yeah. 180 were because that had to be you know we we moved our we moved you into the house into the onto the 180 property in october of 18 september of no excuse me september of 20 2020 20. right in the middle of covid excellent but what was your initial thoughts like, hey, Mandy, we're living in an adult and teen challenge. You want to go move to a similar program, just a bigger space? Or what did it look like? Well, like Dude, what was that decision yeah, process a, for you there's guys? There's a great little story I could tell about that. So we we loved what we were doing at adult and teen challenge. What's cool is like you sometimes have to go through this, I think, with jobs or, or ministry. But like at, there was a point where I didn't like my job and I was having a hard time and I wanted to quit. Mm. And, and God was like, God graciously walked me through that. And, and, and I needed to get right. I needed some perspective shift. And I ended up walking through that. At adult, so instead of like running away from my job at Adult and Teen Challenge at that point in time of hardship, I, uh, I come out the other side of it and I end up, I end up really loving my job. So by the time the 180 thing comes around, I, was, I loved what we were doing mm. at Adult and Teen Challenge. Um, I was not looking for another job. Um, which is really cool because that's just God's grace because then it wasn't me running away from that. It was, it was just this invitation to do this new thing over, over at 180. Um, but yeah, I remember, so I'm like, Denise and PT, they're kind of funny. They will like, they'll come alongside you when you're just like volunteering or hanging out at Love Church. Hey. They'll be like, so like, what do you like see yourself <laughs> doing long term? You know, like, wh- I mean, what kind of ministry roles do you really like? I'm just like. Denise is really good at that. Yeah, it was her. And I'm like, ah, oh, you know. They, so they knew what I was doing yeah. over there, you know. And, and Mandy was on staff already. So we were around some of the staff events and staff activities at this, that time. And so, yeah, they were. I think they were kind of like scouting me out a little bit. Um, but I didn't want anything to do with it, to be honest with you. But we did agree to go to a dinner with PT and Denise at one point in time. Now, this was February of 2020. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, if you guys remember, I don't know what it was like where you're from. Yeah. But in Nebraska, like there was just whispers. Yep. Like there was some concerns. There were some whispers. But I'm telling you, the lockdown hadn't happened. No, so, cause that was March. There was still a restaurant yep. open. We, so in fact, yeah, it wasn't crazy yet. I think the craziness for us in Nebraska happened in March. So it, uh, February, we, we do this dinner with PT and Denise. And they, like, they say, look, this is the dream. Uh, the 180 house. Um, the 180 ministry, you know, do this four month program, this discipleship ministry, um, and to, for guys, just go all in with the Lord and let him, man, um, just bring freedom and, and hope into their lives. And I'm like, oh, it's awesome. This is kind of what we're doing. This is so similar to what we're doing. Um, and I love it. And I was, I was, I felt like I had my, my feet in two different worlds with adult and teen challenge and then love church. I'm like, oh, this is like me getting both things mm-hmm. in one place, the 180 house. And so we prayed about it. We prayed about, you know, we went home. We're like, whoa, let's pray about it. You know, like, I don't really want a new job. We prayed about it and we felt like the Lord was saying, this is me inviting you into this. Like, this is, this is a God thing. And so, um, I mean, it was almost like, this is almost exactly like what happened. Like, we like tell PT and Denise, hey, we're a yes. We'll do that. We'd love to be a part of that. Um, and they're like, okay, great. Well, there's this thing called COVID-19. Turn on the news. Like it's happening yeah. right now. Everything's shutting down. And we're not going to talk about the 180 house for the next six months because the world's going to go into chaos. See ya. Okay. And I'm, I mean, I'm like, all right. So we had said yes to them, but all of a sudden there's this crisis just navigating, you know, try, how to, 
you know, and they did an amazing job navigating that crisis with the team and with the church uh, over those six months. But we were not going to do 180. We're not going to launch 180 no, in March. No. I th- so finally, by the end of the year, things were settling down a little bit, finding some new routines, some new normal, some new new rhythms. And we're like, let's do this 180 thing. Um, so for those six months, man, I, we just kept serving, you know, uh, Adult Teen Challenge needed us. We were helping with that crisis, with the crisis on that side. Um, so it was great. But yeah, it was really weird being like, we know we're going to leave. We hadn't told our bosses yet over there yet, you know. Um, but by God's grace, we got to give them a great heads up, bring in a new staff member, got to handpick my replacement, train him for like a month before we transitioned over to 180 and uh yeah still go over to the adult and teen challenge house because i love those guys yeah um and they're doing incredible work so but yeah we we, we moved into the 180 house be september right yeah so like i think september 15th we moved in and it had been used as really like the office space and the multi-purpose space for like ministry events for a for a number mm-hmm. of years that uh, Love Church had had it. So we just started converting everything to like, let's see, I mean, where do we live? Putting up where, do, where are the guys going to live? Yeah. Um, yeah, like we had a, a, Taking out a stairs. spiral staircase like <laughs> in our master bathroom that like goes downstairs into like this. Uh, it's now the guys' uh, yeah. clo- walk-in closet for the basement room. And I'm like, I don't want somebody walking, walking up, up to the bathroom. Walking up to the bathroom. <laughs> so yeah, we just like did some things and and... And then we found these four guys, and that's when we started working together. I mean, that was yeah. when I really started getting to know you. It was like, hey, here's Matt Jackson. He's executive director. He's he's your boss. You know, PT's kind of giving us the mission and the vision, and he's like, all right, boys, get after it. And we're like, all right, we have 15 days like to like <laughs> switch this place over to a uh, where we can live and move four guys in. And like, by the way, who are the four guys? Oh, oh here they are. Yeah, God brought them. I'm like, well, what are we going to do for four months? We better drop some curriculum, you know? And we had some yeah, ideas. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like it wasn't, we weren't totally uh, reckless. There was some vision. There were some great ideas. But yeah, I mean, once you get into it, it's like. Uh, that, that's the cool thing. We're going to have to build this thing you know, as, we keep, as we go. We, I remember sitting down with PT. It was probably April or May because the weather was starting to get nice. And we sat in where we have our meetings now for 180 and we yeah. that big old whiteboard yep. like we we mapped out him and court kurt warner's day and then mm-hmm. okay now what does it look like for a guy that's not going to play football like yeah. what does it look like and so that was like okay we got a skeleton template but for us to look back on that for me to look back at that whiteboard and then look at what we do now a day to day it's you know the 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 vision is very the same the disciplines are the same but the structure has become so much. It's but the curriculum's better, structure's better. So, the little refinements every season is crazy. But I do remember sitting yeah. there. I don't even know if PT asked me. It was more like, "Hey, this is the next thing you're gonna do for for you know Love Church, or you know, we're gonna call it 180." I'm like, "I'm in. I don't need to pray. Okay, I'm I'm in." Because I, I I like you, similar passion just to help people, based off of where I came from, the stupid decisions I made, and if I can help a guy turn the wheel to the right after jerking it or turn the wheel back to the left after jerking into the ditch. Um, I just love watching people's lives transform that way. Yeah. It's been amazing. So we've been doing this for almost four years. It's been cool. Yeah. I mean, God's just, it's been God's thing, you know, and we've just, everyone that's been on the team just figuring out, okay, God, what are we really doing here? And, and yeah, it has been solidified. And we, I mean, what's crazy is there are some of these pillars that are just, that have been there from day one. It was amazing, actually, what was intact on day one. That's still a big part of what we do. I yeah. mean, stuff like Fresh Start and uh, working out at doing CrossFit and yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I'm authentic I'm, manhood. I mean, oh, huge. Yeah, there's still some of these same things we're doing that are huge for the guys. Yeah, but we couldn't. Yeah, I just couldn't have picked. I said this last week at our golf event. Couldn't have picked a better guy to come in and lead these men than, than you. Like a total God thing, right? His timing's always perfect. We think we're so smart and have it figured out, but I'm mm-hmm. just so proud of you and, and Mandy, her, her presence in the house. It's, it's uh, you know, a lot of these guys that we bring in that say yes to 180, they maybe have never had a, 
a womanly figure like that who is what'd you call her um sold out for jesus and she's a, a babe she's a babe yeah yeah like we they've never experienced a woman like a marriage they see your marriage and go holy cow this is okay this is yeah. real life yeah dude somebody one of the guys said the other day oh you guys fighting oh can i watch this <laughs> i need to learn how to do this like i need to learn how to do this you know like with my wife like we need to and i'm like you can watch for a little you while, and then, I, and then we're gonna have to finish this conversation in the other room. Hey, solving solving conflict in a marriage is an important yeah, task but, and tool. But yeah, I mean, our lives are lived out. Yeah, with the guys. Yeah, um, and Mandy is just a special person to be able to do that. Absolute you know? legend. Um, so yeah, it's so fun, man. Um, yeah, I love it, and I'm growing. I'm telling you, here's here's what God knew I didn't know. Um. You know, like I, I didn't know that I needed that discipleship, you know, at that mm. time in my life. I didn't know I, what I needed was this, all these things God was going to do in my life and in my heart. And, uh, you know, I thought it was only going to be a 12 month program, it ended up being 13 months. But really, I'm telling you, man, it's now been 2014 was when I started this journey of like being discipled with structure and routine and healthy habits and, um, here we are 2024 and I'm like, I'm still in the program. Like yeah, yeah. I basically go through the program, you know, like with the Twice guys year. all the time. And so it's like, I still need it, man. I just, we all do. I still just need the structure, the routine, the disciplines. And, uh, and I'm growing all the time. I'm, I'm, uh, you know, God's teaching me new things all the time. I'm a different guy than I was a few years ago. I'm a different oh, guy than I was 100%. Um, my first year as a staff member at, you know, adult and teen challenge. You know, so yeah, dude, I, I mean, I'll be a different guy a couple years, couple from, years now, from now, you know, and just in a good way. Yeah. You know, just continuing to lean in and let God just like break off the bits of me that aren't, that don't really look like him, you know, that's and the you goal. Have, and you have, uh, I have two things I wanted to kind of wrap with. One, celebrating what you guys have coming up, you and Mandy here at the end of August, right? Due date? Yes. End of we're, August. we're having a baby. That, Isn't that amazing? That could be like the we could do Sam Petro part two, the Dubai and baby story. Yeah, because those are two huge things. Yeah, you know? I'm a, yeah. I mean, I've learned so much just about waiting for the baby and um, being on a journey, you know, of infertility, and then yeah. seeing God answer some prayers. It's a, it's amazing. So yeah, August thirty first is the due date. Um, Mandy's a champion. Um, yeah, we're having we're having our first baby, so that'll be cool. That'll be cool. That'll be you, cool. I, I just, you're going to be such a great dad. I watch you. Yeah, well, this is, you know, I think you had great training grounds in discipling men that are knuckleheads because now you're going to, you know, you got great training how to raise a kid. Yeah. Yeah, man. I, uh, yeah, I can't, I can't wait. Yeah. So, um, yeah, really, really celebrating that. And what else? Yeah. No, the last thing was just, it, it is so, it's so much more evident to me. It makes so much more sense as to why, why I said, I'll repeat what I said. There is not a better guy, like there's not a better guy to lead the 180 ministry other than you. And not that that's like, it's not your uh, identity. Like you're not the discipleship director. You are the discipleship director at 180. But what God has put into you, the talents and gifts, and you're using them to honor him and help these men is profound. And... For people that get to hear this, whether they're uh, a graduate of 180, if they go to Love Church, Christian, wh whoever sees this, it really, uh, the story of your story coming full circle from, you know, growing up in a Christian home, complete rebellion, chaos, and having that moment of just that, that moment with the Lord going, I love you. And I would, Sam, I would do it all for you if it was just, I would do it all again if it was just for you makes so much sense as to why I've always said there's no better there's no better guy on the planet than Sam Petro to lead these men and lead this program on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm thankful, thankful to be involved in this thing with you. Your story is incredible. We'll have to do a part two with the Dubai and the baby story. Maybe the baby can be here with us. The baby story is on uh, Mandy's Oh, on YouTube. Mandy's YouTube. Maybe we'll link it or, yeah. or somehow, somehow do that. But I'm just so proud of you, dude. I'm proud to know you. I'm I'm humbled at your you just being willing to be vulnerable because people can see you now 
as this, you know, going through the refinement process and sanctification. They see you now like, oh, Sam's never struggled. He's That's Sam. He's an ace. Like, he's good to go. Not always the case. Dude. Still not always the case, Dude. right? We're always oh, yeah. still working through through junk. So many mistakes. So I'm proud of you, Sam. Thanks, man. This has been, this yeah. been fun. Can I just, like, piggyback one sec? I know you're wrapping up. No, but, like, go for it, I man. just feel like this is, like, hopefully what people hear from my story, you know, is people ask me sometimes, Oh, that's a that's a really great role that you have. How you go to school to do that? You know, I'm like, um, no, I failed out of college. You know, um, I'm like, no, like you know, you know, all, the only reason, right? Like the only qualification is, man, I just made a mess of my <laughs> life. You know, um, and God, right? Like is doing this thing, and God is just right, done this thing in me and my identity. It was just like, he just loves me. Like, I'm his son. And it's this, like, simple thing that I think anybody, that all of us really need mm-hmm. to get, you know. It's like, dude, for all of you out there that uh, have just screwed up so bad in your life, whether it's addiction or failing a million different things um, or feeling not good enough, man, when you get the revelation of how much God loves you and it has nothing to do with the things you've done or haven't done, man, you will be a weapon for good. You will, um, man, be a tool for God's kingdom. And I feel like that's what my my story is, is like, man, all I did was screw up. But God showed up, did this thing in me, and now I'm just like, I'm hoping to just give that away to the to any of these guys that are coming into our program or these guys that we that we have around Love Church is like, dude, oh, you screwed up a bunch? Awesome. Sweet. Perfect, dude. That's right where you should be. And God can show up in your life. And, you know, because that's yeah. That's my story. I love it. Yeah. We said something earlier. You said, you know, we should pray about it. Let's do that to end it. That's fitting. You just you pray, pray. You pray and we'll bounce, you. man. Yeah. I love it. Thanks, man. Thanks, Matt. Love working with you. I love working for you. Um, yeah, let's pray. Yeah, Lord, thank you so much for this. This is your story. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We're all living our lives in your story. Um, but God, the things that you're doing, um, working working out in in each of us as individuals, uh, God, it's you. Um, so Lord, I pray you get all the glory all the credit. Um, I know what it looks like when I did life my way. And I'm so thankful, God, that you've you've done what you've done. And um, yeah, Lord, I just pray for anybody that's listening, that's watching. Lord, I pray that, that they would encounter you. I pray that they would have a revelation of your love for them, that they would have their identity totally uh, reworked and rewired to be um, a son daughter of yours and lord i pray that that be the thing that defines them going forward so yes lord i pray for encounter fresh encounters with you and your holy spirit um, as people turn to you pray all this in jesus name amen, amen.